everybody hope you all are fine and enjoying a good state of health today's topic for discussion is the osseous circulation or blood supply of the bones this is the third lecture of this series about the skeleton and at the end of this session the participant should be able to define osseous or bone circulation and explain why this is unique type of circulation describe origin course area of supply and anastomosis by different osseous vessels that is arteries and veins and explain concept of centripetal and centrifugal blood flow in the bone supply give differences between blood supply of immature and mature long bones and a brief review of blood supply of other types of bones such as flat and irregular bones and finally explain the concept of the growing end of a bone and the rule of direction of nutrient foramen and nutrient canal osseous circulation or osseous vascular circulation is the blood supply of the bone tissue bone marrow and the related cartilages it consists of three segments number 1 several points of inflow in the shape of arteries number 2 regionally variable sinusoidal networks in the shape of capillaries number 3 draining channels the veins notable point is the that all vascular channels enter and leave from all surfaces of the bone except articular cartilage covered areas blood flow within the bones is unique in two aspects number 1 blood circulates with in a closed cavity so that pressure remains constant and this is achieved in part due to considerable distensibility of the vessels especially veins number 2 it allows traffic of minerals between blood and bone tissue and sends blood cells produced within the bone marrow into the systemic circulation there are four sets of arteries in a bone these are number 1 nutrient or diaphyseal arteries number 2 metaphyseal arteries number 3 epiphyseal arteries number 4 periosteal arteries now we start with the arteries of a typical long bone first the nutrient artery usually it is one or at times maybe two it enters through the for nutrient foramen travels in the nutrient canal and opens into the medullary cavity the site of the foramen and angulation of canal are fairly constant and they point away from the growing end the basis of growing end hypothesis no branch is given in the nutrient canal in the medullary cavity nutrient artery gives two sets of branches number 1 is ascending and descending branches they travel towards the ends and both divide repeatedly and give long medullary arteries which pass towards both the ends and anastomose with epiphyseal and metaphyseal arteries second set of branches is given in the juxta and osteal zone which give multiple circumferential rami they travel transversely and give two types of branches 
first set of circumferential ray mi is the longitudinally oblique transcortical capillaries which travel in the Volkmann's canals, feed Hevesian system of the bones, and ultimately emerge on the surface, where they anastomose with the periosteal arteries, making the basis of centrifugal blood flow system. Second set of MI is the centrally directed centripetal branches which open into meshwork of medullary sinusoids which drain into the thin walled central venous sinus present in the center of the bone marrow cavity and then they are drained by the bone veins notable point is that nutrient artery in this way nourishes whole of the medullary cavity and inner two-third of the cortex of the bone. Second set is the metaphyseal arteries. These are branches from the neighboring systemic vessels which supply the muscles. These arteries enter the bone near its ends and and anastomose with the epiphyseal and diaphyseal arteries. Third set comprises epiphyseal arteries. These are branches from the periarticular anastomosis present on the non-articular part of the bone ends. They enter the bone and anastomose with the branches of the metaphyseal and diaphyseal arteries. Number fourth set is periosteal arteries. A large number of small arteries from the vessels supplying the over overlying muscles. They form the vascular arcade on the periosteum and give multiple branches to the compact and spongy bones. These branches anastomose with the branches of the nutrient artery, making the basis, basis of centripetal blood flow. They supply the outer one third of the long bone cortex. In long bones, epiphyseal and metaphyseal arteries quantitatively are much more important than the nutrient artery as they can effectively replace the nutrient arteries when they get blocked. Nutrient foramen and rule of its direction. At one end of a long bone, rate of growth is relatively more. This is because of the differential growth pattern of the bone. At this end, growth cartilage persists longer, which helps in bone formation for a longer period of time. And this is the basis of the hypothesis of the growing end of a long bone. Nutrient foramen is always directed against the growing end. The reason being nutrient artery runs away from the growing end as the growing bone might pull and rupture the artery. In upper limb, growing ends of the main bones, numerous shown in the diagram, are away from the el elbow. Hence, towards the elbow we go. In lower limb, growing ends of the main bones, tibia shown in the diagram, are close to the knee. Hence, from the knee we flee. Arteries of the bones other than long bones. First, the short long bones. Arteries of these bones are just similar to that seen in the long bones. These bones have only one set of epiphyseal vessel, as these bones have only one epiphysis. Large 
irregular bones. There are two sets of vessels for these bones. Periosteal arteries supply superficial compact bone, whereas the nutrient artery feed the cancerous bone. Both these types of arteries anastomose freely with each other, as is seen in scapula and hip bone. Short irregular bones. In these bones, periosteal arteries enter through non-articular surfaces and supply compact and cancerous bone as well. Example of short irregular bone is vertebrae. In vertebrae, arteries enter through multiple foramina on non-articular surfaces and the main vein, the busy vertebral vein formed inside the vertebral body emerges on the posterior aspect of the body. Next are the flat bones. To these bones, main supply is through periosteal arteries and veins formed in the cancellous bone are large and thin walled and they emerge on the surface. Notable point in this case is that because of the thin wall and large lumens, the cut ends of the vessels remain patent in case of fracture of these bones. Hence, there is more bleeding as happens in case of fracture of the bones of the skull. As regard the immature long bone, blood supply pattern of this bone is just similar to the adult long bone with the differences. Number one, as there is growth plate cartilage present, this forms two discrete vascular zones, epiphyseal and metaphyseal vascular zones. Number two, there is no more no anastomosis across the growth, growth plate cartilage as it is avascular and gets nutrition by diffusion. Number three, periosteum is relatively more vascular and periosteal vessels anastomose more freely with the surrounding vessels. Number four, epiphyseal and metaphyseal arteries are although more in number, they act as end arteries because they can't anastomose ac across the growth plate cartilage. Number five, after fusion of the epiphyses and metaphyses, these arteries no more remain as the end arteries as the arteries of the epiphyses and metaphyses are now free to anastomose with each other and in this way adult pattern of osseous vascularization is established. As regard the venous drainage of the long bones, there is a central venous plexus present in the marrow cavity in the center of the long bone. This is drained by number one nutrient veins, number two metaphyseal vein, number three epiphyseal vein and number four periosteal veins. All these veins follow the fellow arteries. As regard the nerves, or innervation of the bone. Periosteum has got rich innervation, especially at ends from nerves of the overlying muscles. Periosteum of subcutaneous bone is supplied by the nerves of the overlying skin. Hence, it is more sensitive. And the example is shin of the lower limb. Both myelinated and unmyelinated nerve fibers enter the nutrient, enter along with the nutrient artery and supply the bone tissue. Sensitive, sensitivity level of the long bone is that periosteum is most sensitive region. 
spongy bone more sensitive and the compact bone being the least sensitive as regard the lymph drainage no true lymph, lymph vessels are seen in the bone tissue tissue fluid formed is drained through the perivascular spaces towards the lymph vessels which accompany periosteal blood vessels comments and suggestions will be welcomed thank you for listening and watching